She and I got together five times for a total of about 15 hours. And in this 15 hours of channeling, her higher self explained to me in great detail what pre-birth planning is, how it works, why we do it, uh, which challenges have been discussed for this woman, uh, which had been chosen and why, which had not been chosen and why not. So the, this huge volume of information about pre-birth planning was delivered to me and it, it formed the foundation of all three books that I went on to write. Hey, 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 Guy here. Welcome to my podcast. Uh, my epic guest today is Rob Schwartz. And wow, another <laughs> powerful conversation. Uh, he's the founder of Your Soul's Plan. And ultimately, this conversation goes pretty deep. And when you think about, is your life predetermined before you get here or parts of it or some of your experiences anyway? You know, think about the, the challenges we've had, the, the hardships, all this, is this all part of our soul's evolution and our soul's plan for, for growth? Um, and this is a conversation we get into, uh, with Rob today is quite confronted in some, some respects, some of the, some of the things he shared and talked about. But all in all, I love these conversations. Rob's a good guy. And I think it's great to start really exploring, uh, different ideas, philosophies and concepts. If it makes us a better human being and enriches our lives or we can make peace with our past, then, um, I, I think it's fantastic. Anyway, uh, the other thing I want to say is I've had a lot of people reaching out because my, my son was born uh, just a few days ago from recording this. Um, so my baby boy, it went very well. It was a very easy birth and my wife, just amazing, and my daughter as well. So he was born on my birthday, which still blows my mind. Um, pr pretty much the best birthday gift I've ever had. Anyway, I just wanted to say thank you for all the, the comments and wishes that people have been uh, reaching out to me directly, congratulating me. Let's go over to Rob. Enjoy the show. And of course, if you are watching this on YouTube or something, hit me up in the comments. Let me know anything. Subscribe. Help me get the word out. Always helps. Much love. See you soon. Rob, welcome to the podcast. Thank you, Guy. A pleasure to be with you. I'm looking forward to it. There's, it feels like uh, there has been reschedules of the podcast dates technical issues and we're finally here making it happen so i have no doubt it'll be a wonderful conversation today yeah looking forward to it if you were on an airplane right now and you sat next to a stranger and they asked you what you did for a living how would you respond you know my what i do is so far outside the mainstream uh, and i try to be very respectful of where people are at so I would say something like, I'm the author of three spirituality books about the deeper meaning and purpose of life challenges, and I'm a hypnotist. I would not get into the idea of pre-birth planning immediately. Uh, and then depending upon the amount of interest the person showed, uh, I would certainly be willing to share that, but they're going to have to let me know in some way that they're receptive to that kind of thinking. Yeah, I, I can imagine it's even, even on my journey, you know, we were just touching a little bit off air where I've had, you know, my own awakenings and journey and, and leaning into it and everything I, I speak when I share or educate or facilitate always comes directly from my own experiences, you know, firsthand. So I'm very conscious of, you know, um, how much I go because, but, when I heard you share, I was like, wow, that's, that's deep. That's profound. You know, this, it feels like the rabbit hole never ends, to be honest with you. I mean, that's what I'm starting to experience now. So I even found a part of myself kind of like having to grapple with the human side, to think, wow, is that possible? Is that actually happens? You know, even after having some profound experiences. So my question to you is with all of that is, have you always been open to this work or were you atheist? Were you closed off? What was your journey like to, to lead you to this point? You know, I, I was actually raised in a, a reform Jewish family. Uh, so we were not particularly observant of the major holidays. And, you know, I had a bar mitzvah and those kinds of things. Uh, but I've always been uh, spiritual without being particularly interested in religion. And what happened for me, I was uh, in the mainstream corporate world for a number of years, 
self-employed as a marketing and communications consultant, did not like that work at all. It, it was deeply unfulfilling. And perhaps more to the point, I had this nagging sense, actually a knowing, that I had come to Earth to do something else that I wasn't doing. But I didn't know what it was, and I, I didn't even know how to figure out what it was. And this went on for a long time. And then back in 2003, the, the universe essentially staged uh, what amounted to an intervention. And three very important things happened within a short time of each other. Uh, the first was in, in my search to figure out what to do with my life, I went to see a psychic medium, which is not something I had ever done before. And I wasn't even sure if I believed in it. But I thought, why not? You know, I'll invest an hour of my time. And if nothing comes of it, there's no harm done. So this was back on May 7, 2003. I, I remember the date because that was the date on which my life completely changed. The medium starts the session by saying to me, your spirit guides are here. And I said, what is a spirit guide? I mean, I never even heard the term before. Hmm. So she explained that. And then she said, your guides would like to talk directly with you. And she started to channel them. The first thing they said right out of the box was, you planned your life, including your biggest challenges, before you were born. Well, I shook my head and I said, well, why in the world would I do something like that? And they said, you did this for purposes of spiritual growth. Now, I probably would have dismissed all of this as some kind of delusion on my part, except that the guides then launched into this very lengthy, detailed monologue in which they went through my challenges one by one and told me why I had planned them before I was born. And they knew what all of them were, even though I told them nothing about myself and had told the medium nothing prior to the session. So this blew my mind wide open. I mean, here I was talking to beings who know everything about me without me telling them anything. And I came out of that session, and for weeks afterwards, I thought about this idea of free birth planning constantly. And the effect that it had on me was that it really created quite a deep healing, because it allowed me to see for the first time deeper meaning and deeper purpose to the most challenging things that had happened mm -hmm. to me. And to the point there, I grew up in a very, very abusive family situation. My mother has significant mental health issues and was extremely abusive to me the first 16 years of my life until my parents divorced. So to finally get some kind of understanding as to how something like that could happen, uh, and that I was not a victim, that I actually chose this experience for a number of very good reasons, this really was deeply healing. And then I thought, you know, if this perspective can create this kind of healing for me, surely it can do the same for others. That was when I first started to think about writing uh, the book that eventually became Your Soul's Plan. And then within just a few weeks of the session with the medium, I was introduced to this woman who has the ability to go into trance and channel her soul. So I said to her, I'm thinking of writing a book about how we plan our lives before we're born. May I speak with your soul about this subject? And fortunately for me, she said yes. She and I got together five times for a total of about 15 hours. And in this 15 hours of channeling, her higher self explained to me in great detail what pre-birth planning is, how it works, why we do it, uh, which challenges have been discussed for this woman, uh, which had been chosen and why, which had not been chosen and why not. So the, this huge volume of information about pre-birth planning was uh, delivered to me. And it, it formed the foundation of all three books that I went on to write. And then within just a few weeks of that experience, the most powerful experience of all, I was home alone in my apartment in Chicago, where I lived at the time, doing this corporate writing that I so did not enjoy. And in the middle of a weekday afternoon, I said to myself, I think I'll take a break and go for a walk. So I'm walking down the sidewalk in Chicago middle of the afternoon, sun is shining. And all of a sudden, every time I look at another person, there's this feeling of pure, overwhelming, unconditional love for that person. And when I say unconditional love here, this was not a human love. This was divine love, a transcendent kind of love. There really are no words for it, but that's as close as I can get in the English language. 
I remember this experience so clearly because the first person I saw was a cab driver. He was just sitting in his cab waiting for a customer to come along. And I looked at this man who was a complete stranger and just felt overwhelming, pure, unconditional love for him. And then I saw somebody else and felt that way for them. And it went on and on and on. Every time I looked at another person, this feeling was present. As this was happening, you could say that I was caused to know. I was caused to know that we as souls are made literally from the energy of unconditional love. I got that message, that understanding loud and clear. What I didn't know at that time was why this was happening. That became clear a couple of years later. After this combination of the session with the medium, the person, this woman's channeling of her higher self, and this experience of unconditional love, I left the corporate world, started working on your soul's plan. And by a couple of years later, I'd looked at many pre-birth plans for my book. What I found was that in every case, no exceptions, the pre-birth plan was based on complete unconditional love for every person involved. And then I realized, aha, that experience walking down the sidewalk a couple of years ago, that was gifted to me so that when I found this result in my research, I would be absolutely certain it was true. And it's because of that experience that I can say to your audience today with complete confidence and certainty that I believe that we as souls are made literally from the energy of unconditional love. That was my experience walking down the sidewalk that day. Wow. Well, that, that's certainly my belief system, too, t to this point from my experiences, without a shadow of a doubt. But until we, we have some direct experience, it's very hard to fathom because we don't even know what we're we're looking for, <laughs> you know? So there's a, there's a lot to unpack there, Rob. And um, my first kind of question, and even thinking in terms of the people I get in front of and people that are leaning into this work, to pull upon your past experiences, because you spoke about it was very healing for you that period of time. And you talked about your abusive mother, because we, we have many people that will come in with some kind of tr trauma, generally, or pain point, you know, the, and quite often they haven't even related the, 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 the pain to, um, the, the current circumstances in life. There's, there's, there's not even a connection there or something, but, and we, we tend to shut it down and avoid it. When you spoke about your healing, was that the healing of the relationship with your mom at that time and that abusiveness? Had it played out in your life before that and unconsciously? Was it like a holding? I mean, I'd love you to speak to a little bit about that a bit more. So the, the first and I think the most important thing that came out of this awareness of pre-birth planning is that I'm not a victim. And I believe that nobody is actually a victim. That is a very difficult concept for the human brain to wrap itself around. Mm -hmm. Because certainly you can look out at the world, look at the news anytime it comes on the air. There seems to be a lot of evidence indicating that people are victims. But it's my understanding, and this has been confirmed again and again. I, I've been researching pre-birth planning for literally 20 years now. We plan the most difficult things that happen to us. They're not planned as certainties, usually, and they're planned as potentials, sometimes very high probabilities, but we ourselves choose them. Now, people find this uh, very hard to grasp and sometimes quite objectionable. And they say, well, why would we do that? You have to understand that when you're back on the other side and you're planning the upcoming incarnation, you lay down certain themes, certain karmic tracks, we could call them, things that you want to learn, that you want to do, that you want to work on. And you're willing to experience, and sometimes very eager to experience, great challenges because you see them as providing the opportunity and the motivation to cultivate certain qualities that I call divine virtues. These are things like unconditional love, compassion, empathy, patience, faith, trust, and so on. The challenges give you the opportunity and the motivation to cultivate the virtues. The virtues are very important to your soul. Also, when you're back on the other side planning an incarnation, you know that nobody is permanently harmed by anything that happens here. You know that a lifetime is actually a very brief 
from that perspective, it's here and gone like a clap of thunder. And you also know that the wisdom, the healing, the expansion that come out of an incarnation, those things become part of you literally for all eternity. So from that perspective, nobody is permanently harmed. A lifetime is very brief. The wisdom becomes part of you for eternity. From that perspective, it does make sense that some souls, not all, some would play in great challenges. Now, coming back to my mother, you asked about the healing. The healing there has been internal for me. It's not in the relationship itself. The reason for that is that due to who she is in this incarnation and the limitations that she's chosen to experience, uh, it's not possible for me to have any kind of discussion with her about what happened. The reason for that, for the most part, is that she suppressed the memories of what she did. So if I were to bring up and make any reference to what had happened, she would quite literally have no idea what I was talking about. And it would traumatize her to hear what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. Well, she's now in her mid-80s. Let her live out the rest of her life in peace. This is obviously going to come up in her life review. Let her work it through with her guides. But there's been enough trauma here already. I don't want to cause trauma for her. So I have worked internally to forgive her. And pre-birth planning has been the foundation of that forgiveness. Now, there's more to the healing process than just understanding intellectually that I planned it and even knowing the reasons why. That's a quantum leap from, from being in victim consciousness. But the energy of the trauma, the energy of the abuse, it enters through the chakras of the body, gets distributed to the cells of the body, and it's there. This is why people who have experienced trauma, they know that there's trauma in them, they can sense it, but they can't quite access it consciously, usually, on their own. So you need something more. And to access it, people will use hypnosis. And that's one of the reasons why I'm a hypnotist. Uh, we offer, I offer private sessions and online workshops focused primarily on something called a between life soul regression, where you can talk with your council of elders about why you planned a traumatic experience and how to heal from it. Uh, a lot of healing of trauma comes from a between life soul regression, but you don't have to do it just through hypnosis. It can come through uh, meditation and your own communing with spirit. There's, uh, as I'm sure you know, uh, a renaissance these days in plant and other medicines, and people, are, myself included, are using those to uh, excavate the last remnants of their trauma. And uh, I've had profound healing on that path, and I'm continuing on it to this day. So the, the uh, healing technologies are here now, and I think all of that has been quite... Uh, consciously guided by spirit, because we're, we're going through an ascension process, and part of that means purification. You have to release these suppressed traumas, these frozen or trapped crystallized energies, because they can't go with us where we're going. We're moving to a higher vibration, and they have to be cleared or released or purified. Wow, there's a lot in there. Every time you speak, Rob, have you... <laughs> Thank you for the explanation. The, uh, you know, it's fascinating. I, I kind of many years ago kind of give up the 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 wanting to know what the trauma is and what it means and what it holds, and and I kind of let go of that charge. And one thing I actually did quite religiously for quite a period of time was just sit in my energy centers every morning. I would just get up and be with them, and over time there was an unwinding out of that. I could feel different elements wanting to just process just by bringing pure awareness to that and you know relinquishing the mind is quite incredible and then when you start bringing in experiences like you spoke about and, and that's why i love holding group environments because the energy can be palpable and people can have um, a direct uh, experience that way too gosh I'm, I'm just a bit in which direction to go in here i, I want to speak to the ascension a little bit first then 
why why are we ascending right now and what happens if we resist and what happens if we if we go with the flow per se and allow that um i don't know purge if whatever word you would like to use that that can be happening as well well let, let, i don't want to assume that everybody knows about ascension so let, let's start with the basics that's right yeah uh so what is ascension it is literally the ascending, the rising in vibration of Earth and every person who is on the Earth. What's causing it? As I understand it, it's caused by divine light, direct from source, flooding the planet. So the light has the effect of bringing to the surface, bringing to conscious awareness, everything unlike itself, meaning everything of a lower vibration. Trauma obviously, would be of a lower vibration. And again, this process is called purification. It has to happen because these lower vibrational energies can't go with us where we're going. So where are we going? Well, as I understand it, we've already moved from the third dimension, or what technically really should be called third density, into fourth density. That's where we're at now. And we're on our way to fifth density, which is a vibration of oneness, consciousness, and unconditional love. So essentially, we are going home without leaving the physical body, if you choose to stay in body on planet Earth. But you can't get to fifth density, you can't get home, stay in a physical body at the same time, and carry trauma and anger and lack of forgiveness and so on with you. All of that has to be released. So how do you release it? Well, we've touched on some of that. But the main thing that's happening here, the, the light that's causing ascension, when it brings trauma or anger or whatever it might be to conscious awareness, that's the first and most important step in releasing these lower vibrational energies. There's, I can't explain the mechanics of why it works this way, but there's something about when you become consciously aware of a lower vibrational energy within your consciousness, your conscious awareness of that energy frees it up to move. It's no longer trapped, suppressed, frozen, crystallized, whatever word you want to use. Now it's free to move. That's step number one. The next step in releasing it is to thank the energy, whatever it is. Thank it sincerely if you can for whatever it taught you. Don't say what you don't actually feel, but if you can give thanks, sincerely do that. The next step is to bless it. And the fourth and final step is to set an intention to release it to the universe for transmutation. Those are the four main steps in letting go of these traumas and other low vibrational energies. Also, I, I want to touch on something you said uh, a moment ago. You were talking about pure awareness. That is very important. And that, that's essentially where I'm at now in my own personal spiritual path. You know, the intellectual understanding that came through my study of pre-birth planning, that was very, very helpful, very healing, very important. Uh, it's only now, in retrospect, I can say that that was a transitional stage to now being focused on pure awareness. Uh, and if I don't want to take up too much time talking about what pure awareness is. that That's essentially mm -hmm. another podcast unto itself. But um, people can Google the term and find infinite information about this. Um, the gist of the idea there is that, you know, there's only one being in existence, the one self, the real self, the true self, whatever term somebody wants to use. Yeah, there is no separate self. You, you are not separate from the one being, neither am I. Nobody actually is. We just appear to be due to the limitations of the five senses. So when you meditate and sit in your energy centers as you do, over time, if you stick with it and do it often enough, long enough, go deep enough, you will come into some awareness of the one self, which is you. You will know yourself as the one self. And to the extent that you do this, it brings in the energy of your full self which is deeply, deeply healing, as you have experienced. Yeah, and it, 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 it's nothing. It's nothing quite like it. And I, I found as well that once you 
the, like it, it, there's obviously there needs to be a surrender and letting go and, and a trust in the process. And that's why, you know, I heavily leaned into podcasts and, and teachers and books and things because many people that walk the path say, show you a roadmap, but you still have to take that step and start to, I guess, yeah, surrender, not get frustrated in it. When's it going to happen? How is it going to happen? And that push just tend to kept pushing it away from me. And the moment I really just started to say, okay, today is my gift today. This moment is my gift and be with it. Then things really started to move. And once you develop that relationship, you, you, you can't unlearn it. You can't unknow it. And it really changes something fundamentally within you. Well, it did for me anyway. That's for sure. You know, do you know much about the ascension process of the planet? Like, is it a cycle? How long has it been going on for? What is happening? Are we talking over the next few months, years, decades? Have you uh, got any my, thoughts on that? My understanding comes from, uh, well, a number of sources, but most recently, uh, there's a wonderful channel book called The Age of the Heart. It just came out. Uh, it's channeled by Jesus. Uh, the channel's name is Sebastian Blakesley. I would recommend that to everyone. I find that to be a completely credible source. Uh, so what Jesus says in that book is that uh, 10 years from now, in the year 30, 20, um, 2033, there will be uh, a quantum shift in the nature of our reality. And the 10 years between now and then is essentially devoted for most people who are willing to do the work to the purification, the transmutation, the releasing of the trauma and other low vibrational energies. Uh, that's the time frame that I'm working with. Okay. Well, could you repeat the name of the book, please? It's called The Age of the Heart. The Age of the Heart. Okay. I'll definitely check that out for sure. Thank you. So moving on from that then, if we have a pre-birth plan. To me, that's kind of leaning into the fact that then we have many lives and each time we get to come back and, and work on an aspect of ourselves. With, with that in mind, what, are, what, are, what ultimately then is the goal of the soul? If, if that is the case, what are we, what are we moving toward? Or is that just my, analytical goal oriented human self thinking about these things too much i think what so let me share my understanding of how we came to be here and what, what we're doing here uh the billions of us who are incarnate now on planet earth as i understand it uh eons and eons ago in what would be linear time even though we come from a realm of no time uh, we got together and we said to ourselves, we would like to make a unique contribution to the Godhead. We would like to give Source an experience that Source has never had before and that no beings have ever created before. What could it be? And so a number of ideas were tossed around. And the idea that we liked the most was to experience separation. We asked the question, what would it be like to leave the oneness and experience ourselves as completely separate individual beings, separate from each other, separate from source? Now, you can't actually separate from source. You can't separate from the one. It just isn't possible. But what you can do is create the illusion that you have separated from source. So since that was the only possibility, we said, all right, that, that's what we'll do. We will create an artificial environment in which we have the perception of separation. So we put this idea forward to those who love and guide us, those who are more highly evolved than we. And then a lot of discussion ensued, back and forth, back and forth. Should we do this? Is it a good idea? Is it not? Those who love and guide us, who are more highly evolved, said to us when we put this idea forward, we do not recommend that you do this. We foresee tremendous suffering. And there was more discussion back and forth, back and forth. And at the end of the discussion, 
they stuck with that position. We do not recommend that you do this. We foresee tremendous suffering. And we said, essentially, noted, but we've got this. We want to do this. We can do it. And we are going to do it. So we chose to go against the advice of those who love and guide us. And then the experience of separation was created because free will is sacrosanct. We, each one of us, is the creator. So we get to create whatever we want, and nobody's going to stand in the way of us doing that. So we created this artificial environment in which we appear to be separate from God and from each other. When separation started, the, the initial response to it, when we found ourselves in this state of consciousness, was some kind of hysteria, as I understand it. We knew that we had separated in our perception from the one, and this uh, was tremendously fear-inducing, tremendously anxiety-inducing. We no longer felt bathed in the unconditional love of source. We perceived ourselves being alone and separate in a, in a quite hostile and dangerous environment. And then from there, uh, the ego came to be. The ego was part of the plan. Uh, we wanted the ego for two reasons. One, it's very, very good at keeping the individual alive. And we were going to need that to stay alive in this experience of separation. We also wanted the ego because we wanted to have this internal voice to talk to, some voice within us to talk with so that we didn't feel quite so alone. But what happened over time is that the, the ego, which is completely fear-based, became bigger and stronger and louder and more insistent and essentially took over the human experience. So the ego prompted people to, over eons of time, to take fear-based, uh, self-oriented actions of a very low vibration, which created karma, uh, caused a lot of suffering, as had been foreseen. And the what's happening now with the ascension is essentially the reversal of that. At the moment we separated, God or Source put into place a plan to bring us home. And ascension is that plan. It's the reversal of the reversal. In other words, it's the reversal of separation. So now... With all this light flooding the planet, people are waking up uh, en masse. You know, there's a worldwide spiritual awakening occurring. And people are starting to see the ego for what it is. They're starting to realize that they are not the ego. And then, in fact, the ego is leading them in a direction they don't really want to go in, a direction that is not loving. And we're starting to move away from that. And it's going to rapidly accelerate, I believe, over the next 10 years. Wow. So does that then, I'm just wrapping my head around everything you just said. The, so within our soul's journey, when we make contracts or, or sort of have these plot points you speak about, when we come here then to experience what's happening, is then ascension a requirement as part of our growth to overcome the challenges or, or could it just be a life of suffering or does it really depend on where we're at on our soul's journey? How, how do you see it? it the, there's an intersection, a very elegant and intricate intersection between pre-birth planning uh, with the pre-birth plan being formulated by the soul, by the higher self in consultation with God, angels, and master and guides. There's an intersection between that and the free will of the incarnate personality. So if you're in body on planet Earth now during the ascension, you've planned for ascension to be at least a possibility uh, that may come to fruition for you. But free will cooperation is required. You know, if somebody chooses to stay asleep, chooses to stay enmeshed in ego, enmeshed in fear, again, free will is sacrosanct. No being in the not physical is going to override that person's decision. And really, the bottom line here is that 
what you experience, whether you ascend or you don't, what happens in your life, what doesn't happen, everything you experience is the result of your vibration. Your frequency either allows it into your experience or does not allow it into your experience. Essentially, the higher your vibration, the more your learning will come to you through love, peace, and joy. The lower your vibration, the more pain and suffering there's going to be. You can learn either way. They're both valid paths, but one is much more arduous than the other. So if somebody chooses to stay in fear, stay in ego, stay asleep, is heavily invested in separation consciousness for whatever reason, uh, that will be respected and you don't have to go through the ascension process. Someone who's making that choice, whether conscious or subconscious, uh, would most likely leave the physical body at some point during the ascension. Okay. So how would you then break down from being human to, obviously there's the ego, then there's the soul, then we speak of the higher self, then you even spoke of the Godhead, which I'm assuming is unity, oneness, consciousness itself. Like, how, how do you see each role interplaying with each other in that evolution? So I, I think there, there are essentially three levels here. At the highest level, the highest vibration, that's oneness. That's the one being, the true self, the real self. And then if you step down a bit in vibration, you have the individuated soul. So we could say that the soul, the higher self, is a spark of God. And then if you step down uh, enormously in vibration from that level, you have the incarnate personality. We could say that the personality is a spark of the soul. So there, there's an interaction, uh, a oneness between all three levels and an interaction among all three levels. The To take it back to pre-birth planning, the pre-birth plan, as I understand it, is created by the soul in consultation with God, source, guides, angels, masters, and so forth. And then what happens is the soul creates the personality, which is the portion of its energy that will go into the physical body. The soul then informs the personality of what the life plan consists of. Now, when you are told what's in your life plan, you feel this overwhelming, unconditional love coming from your higher self, coming from your guides. You know with absolute certainty that the plan has been created for your highest good. And so at that point, when people are told what the plan is, the vast majority agree, and then they incarnate. But there's a very, very small percentage who, when they're told what the plan is, they start to feel human emotions like fear or doubt, essentially fear or doubt that perhaps it's too much. We're taking on too much here. If you voice fear or doubt, then the plan is amended until it's completely acceptable to you. So at that point, the vast majority then agree to the plan and incarnate. There's a very small percentage of the small percentage who express fear or doubt who continue to express fear or doubt. If you do that, the plan is amended again until it's acceptable to you. And if it's never acceptable to you, then you choose not to incarnate. So bottom line, nobody is forced to do anything that they don't actually agree to do. Wow. So then with the this, this soul, and I often ponder on this, are there multiple uh, me's incarnating at different time points all coming back that with different plot points that we've chosen happening in parallel to this? Or is it just the one soul, the one guy, the, or the one personality? How do you it, view that? It, is that? This is something that came up in the research for my books. And it, it's my understanding that there, there are parallel selves in parallel dimensions. And they are playing out variations on what's happening in this particular lifetime. Uh, so, for example, in my second book, Your Soul's Gift, there's a, a chapter about the pre-birth planning of a rape. The person's name is Beverly. And we speak with Jesus uh, in a channeling session to talk about her pre-birth plan. 
And he confirms that she did agree to have this experience. Uh, and then we get into a discussion. I ask him, are there other Beverly's in parallel dimensions? And he says, yes. And I ask, are there Beverly's in parallel dimensions who did not experience the rain? And he says, yes. And then I say, well, can, can you explain how this works? It's very difficult for, for a human brain to understand it. So he draws an analogy. He says, think of the soul like the trunk of a tree. And the branches coming off the tree are the different personalities in different incarnations. And if you think about how a tree grows, branches sprout and they become bigger and bigger. And then eventually a branch will die. It will fall off the tree. And then another branch grows and grows and grows. And so there's this cycling of branches growing and, and falling off the tree. And he says that's essentially what is happening with incarnations on Earth and parallel Earths in parallel dimensions. Uh, also, in Your Soul's Gift, there's a chapter about the pre-birth planning of mental illness. And this subject of parallel selves comes up again there. The person who's the subject of this chapter, her name is Michaela, she, for decades, experienced a very unusual form of psychosis in which, uh, starting in childhood and continuing into middle age, if she was asleep at night and had a nightmare, when she woke up in her bed in the morning, the nightmare would appear to continue in her bedroom. So let's say she had a nightmare about a monster attacking her. When she woke up in the morning, it would appear to her that the monster was in the room with her, still continuing to attack her. As you can imagine, this was terrifying and completely disrupted her life for a very long time. So Jesus starts to talk to us about what is going on here. Why is this happening? And the gist of it is that there are parallel Michaelas in parallel dimensions who have traumas of their own, unhealed energies of their own. And Michaela in, on our earth, in our dimension, by having this experience where the nightmare seems to continue into daily life, that experience allows her soul to energetically process the unhealed energies of the parallel Michaelas. So she's actually acting in service to them. It's a, it's a gesture of profound love and a gesture of profound service. Wow. Wow. So with that multiple souls, the, the tree, I love the analogy of the tree as well. Does there become a point where we've experienced everything, we've learned everything, and then we don't come back? And there's another layer upon that of growth and a layer upon that of growth. Do you, is, do you see that's the direction that we we tend to be moving toward? What I found in the in the research for my books, and also the the private between life soul regressions that I do, is that uh, each person decides for themselves when they're complete with their Earth experience. So that there's always more that you could do, something else that you could learn, some other way to be of service. But you decide at the end of a lifetime, I'm complete with this experience or that experience, I'm complete with Earth, or I'm not complete, I want to do something else on Earth, or I want more of this particular kind of experience. The feeling of incompletion is karma. Karma is widely misunderstood. A lot of people think that it's some kind of cosmic punishment for having done bad deeds. It's not a punishment. That's not the universe's intention. It's intended to be a balancing, and people themselves choose to have experiences that allow for the balancing. The balancing creates a feeling of completion with the experience, and then you're free to go on to something else. But you decide for yourself. You see everything in the life review, and then you say to yourself, I'm complete with that, or I'm not complete with that. Hmm. It's fascinating, hey, because I, I feel, I just feel like I need to mention this, but on my healing journey, which continues, I feel like I've been healing many things beyond my life experience right now as well. <laughs> you know, oh, um, and also traumas of my, my generations. Um, and certainly past life stuff has come up in some of the 
experiences have had as well. And I, I find that fascinating how we incarnate with these as well. Is that all part of the planning as well? Do you, do you that is, that's very much part of the planning. Uh, and this comes back again to the idea that we, we, there is no separate self. The, the, sep- the apparently separate self, it, you're actually a stream. And the stream consists of your ancestors who incarnated before you in linear time and those who are coming after you in your family stream further down the river later in linear time. Uh, linear time, of course, is an illusion. But the point here is that you're not a separate self, you're a stream, and your ancestors and those coming after you are part of the stream. So when you heal, you bring healing back in time to the ancestors and also forward in time to those who are coming later in linear time. Wow. Wow. So I, I'm just conscious of my time and, and wrapping up the podcast soon, but... With you, Robin, you're working with many people now. Um, they're, they're obviously coming. There must be a deep pain or um, something that's driving them, I'm guessing, unless there's many just open and curious and see where it wants to take them. But I'd imagine, how do you, like, what, what's the footnotes? What do people need to, to be doing to get to the, these places that you speak of to allow those healings? to happen when you work with people? Is it as simply as surrendering and letting your subconscious guide you? That, that's probably the single most powerful thing anybody can do. Uh, surrender is widely and badly misunderstood in our world, with, but is defeat, capitulation. That, that is not at all what true surrender really means. True surrender means you trust that everything is serving your awakening, everything is serving your highest good, no matter how painful it is, and you surrender to it in trust. And when you surrender, your suffering decreases tremendously because suffering is the result of resistance. And obviously, if you surrender, then you're no longer in resistance or you're in less resistance than before you surrendered. The other thing that surrender does that that is profoundly helpful in healing, it creates spaciousness. It creates external spaciousness and, more importantly, internal spaciousness in your consciousness. So you could think of resistance as essentially a block to love, a block to God or source or spirit coming in to your consciousness. And when you surrender and let go of resistance, that block to love is now diminished or gone. Now you've created internal space where light, literally, light can flood into you. Love, literally, can flood into you. And the light will direct you. It will give you information. And the love will heal you. But it's up to you to create the internal spaciousness. So again, you do that through surrender, through non-resistance. Meditation and prayer are the most powerful ways to do that, in my opinion. Wow. Yeah. Rob, I, I feel like we've only scratched the surface today, mate, with <laughs> the things that <clears throat> we've been discussing. With with everything we've covered today, Rob, what would you like to leave the listeners to ponder on? Well, I, I would say if uh, you have any challenge in your life or have had trauma of any kind, and you'd like to understand why did it happen, what does it mean, how do I respond to it, how do I heal from it, uh, I would strongly recommend consider a between-life soul regression, either as a private session, or we do it as a group frequently in online workshops. And all this information is on my website at YourSoulsPlan.com. If you actually click on the sessions page, there's a video of a one-hour private between-life soul regression. You can see exactly what that is like. Uh, And whether you do it with me or another practitioner, it doesn't matter, but be willing to do the healing, the releasing, the feeling that is called for in these times of ascension and purification. Your healing creates an energetic pathway that makes it easier for literally every single person on the planet to do their healing. They can follow in your energetic pathway. When When you heal yourself, it's like you, you've come up on the edge of a, a very thick jungle. You've got a machete. 
there's no trail already established. So you take your machete and you start hacking away. And you hack and you hack and you hack, and it's a lot of work and it takes a long time sometimes. But then eventually you've hacked a path through this thick jungle. Well, now everybody who follows behind you, it's so much easier for them. Mm. Your healing is everybody's healing. Yeah, 100%. And it allows, it allows us to feel empowered too, that we actually are contributing to the whole and making a difference. Which is, yep. which is for me everything, you know. And then I, I know where I can focus myself, my attention, on as as we move through these challenging times that are happening. Where can people find you, Rob? Like the if you say I'll make sure there's a link in the show notes for your website anyway. But if people want to come and check you out, where's the best place? The uh, best place is yoursoulsplan dot com. Uh, take a look at the events page. That's where all our workshops are. We have. Uh, the Between Life Soul Regression Workshops, an Empath Workshop, a Star Souls Workshop for people who are from faraway places. Uh, we have a Higher Self Workshop. There are workshops in uh, Polish, German, Spanish. Look again at the sessions page. Watch the video of the Between Life Soul Regression. And check out the books, Your Soul's Plan, Your Soul's Gift, Your Soul's Love. Uh, they're available in, in Australia, certainly, and all around the world. Uh, read some of the stories of rebirth planning, and it will help you to understand who you really are and, and what it is that you're doing here. Yeah, yeah, beautiful. Thank you so much, Rob. I really appreciate your time. I'm glad we finally made the podcast happen today. Uh, it was fascinating. Um, yeah, thank you so much. My pleasure. My pleasure. Yeah.